there was a, like a lot of prisoners of war, they don't like to talk about it. But eventually Frank did tell me a few things. He always had a twinkle in his eye, he had lovely blue eyes. I remember him coming to our family Christmas lunches because Frank had no family of his own. He never met his father, of course. His father died fighting in World War I. I still believe to this day that he only told us what he wanted to tell us, what he thought we could cope with. I honestly believe he took a lot of the horror stories with him to his grave. Things were absolutely different to now. It was made that if you were able, you, you went to war for king and country. Within a week or so, you were sent away. They didn't waste time. I think we lived our lives pretty much in parallel. Without really knowing Frank, we would have both gone to the Middle East, gone to Syria. We would have both gone back to, to Suez. We would have both gone to Java. We would have had the same journeys, but probably slightly different destinations. The two ships, one had the troops on it, and the other ship had most of the ammunition. So they landed in Java, north. Communication uh, wasn't that good then. And they landed there, and the Japanese had already taken it. We did oppose the Japanese on two or three occasions and lost several of our men. And then the Dutch capitulated and they surrendered the entire Dutch East Indies. So that was the beginning of our life as prisoners of war. It was a short time in Changi prison camp in Singapore. They uh, went north to uh, Hellfire Pass. They were digging the area out for the railway to go through. A lot of them passed passed away on that because they, they weren't, weren't getting decent food. When we refer to Hellfire Pass, we're talking about a portion of the railway line, three to four kilometres long, at a given part of the track. They had to dig and cut out so that the railway could fit through the mountains. They were, had to work long hours. They'd lose a lot of sleep because of the storms of the rain and and the heat of the sun as well. I always had the open sky, the Kwai River Valley. It's quite a beautiful valley. The beautiful sunsets. There were birds, there were trees, there was jungle noises. It was easy to consider abandoning hope, but we were led by very, very wonderful people. It's sometimes considered that as prisoners of war the Japanese, we were just there as one mass of crawling ants. But that was not the case. Because each work battalion had its own construction. We were led by a senior officer of our own. We worked within the authority of our own people. But our own people were completely subservient, of course, to the Japanese. Eventually, they shipped them over to Japan a lot of coal mines there. In our case, it took us 70 days, 10 weeks. It was a long and uncomfortable journey. Whatever camp we were in, whatever condition we were in, we had lice and fleas and bed bugs infested with them. Ran into some difficulties with American submarines and some of them were sunk. I don't think our ship was worth a shot was pretty much a hulk to start with. I have no doubt that the camp was not built for the prisoners of war. It was a camp that was used by the Japanese to operate the mine before we arrived. He was working on the windlass deep down in the coal seams. He used to windlass the coal up to the surface. One day he, was not, he wasn't well and he didn't have to go down there. And that, t that night, the roof or the rocks fell down onto the windlass and the person that was uh, uh, operating it got killed. You know, I, re I remember him mentioning about that, that he, was, he should have been the one that, mm. that mm. died, but mm. he didn't. And that's what I think 
kept him going. He felt as if he was meant to still be here. He was spared twice then, once on the ships going to Japan because the ship he was on wasn't yeah. bombed. His mum had already gone through losing his father. So I guess he desperately wanted to survive Five, and, and yeah. to go home. And another day goes by and you start the next day. So morale, I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's not a quality that you can quantify, is it? You can't weigh it up, you can't put it in a bag, you can say there's so much of this and so much of that. Uh, when the war finished, Frank and others were found and brought home. He had lost quite a bit of weight, but some of them were a lot worse off because there's beriberi, uh, malaria, all sorts of um, ailments. Frank was about one of the only ones, ones that actually walked yeah, off could the train. Yeah, walked off the train. All others were mm. in, in, on stretchers or in wheelchairs. Frank was considered a healthy one. He kept in touch very frequently with uh, my wife and myself. And we used to go on road trips and so forth. So he was quite active up to the end. Though he didn't actually go to any returned soldiers um, meetings or get togethers and he didn't march in the Anzac Day marches, when he passed away there were specific instructions at his burial service to have the Australian flag laid on his coffin mm. and to have members from the Returned Soldiers League to play the last post. We had our, our own little uh, our own little range of associates, people in our platoons. We had the togetherness, although we, our ways went in different directions. We still maintained some sense of belonging to the battalion. And as I have mentioned, I came home with some members of the battalion that I had gone away with. So we just didn't disperse like smoke. Oh, that's part of a, that's walking along, that's where our camp would have been, just up here, and the river's down there. Did you take these photos? Yes. Mm. It was wonderful going back there. <laughs>